So let's continue with this expression. First of all, there is the A0, which is the Bohr magnet one, which can be represented as such. Alpha is a fine structure constant. Or if you write this as E squared over H bar C, you can turn it into uh, what expression? E squared over H bar C, H bar over F C alpha. Let me check. I don't want to make any mistakes in these <coughs> constants. So let me, obviously, if we have to reduce everything to the fundamental constants, therefore, let me replace A0 with that expression, and let's see what do I have in here. E squared over 2m squared c squared times 2n squared over alpha squared, if you want, just let, let's list them all, h bar squared over mc squared times 1 over a0 cubed. 1 over a0 cube is the 1 over the cube of this thing, therefore it's m cube e to the sixth divided by h bar to the sixth power, right? m cube e to the sixth h bar to the sixth power. So there will be some cancellations and then we are going to uh, try to combine them into a group, say m squared then m and m cubed goes away and there are uh, what are left over is e squared there are twos cancel e squared and this goes away makes it h bar to the 4 divided by h bar to the 4 and there is c to the 4 in here right that's nice And there is also uh, E6, E8, and there is alpha, 1 over alpha squared. I think I included everything, and there is also this n squared. Let's see what do I have. You see, things are really uh, nicely uh, converging to something very nice. If you remember, alpha equals E squared over H bar C, then E to the 8 divided by h bar 4 to the c4 is alpha to the 4. Alpha to the 4 and alpha squared nicely cancels and you have alpha squared times n squared. And if you go to the most quantum, most quantum of the state, n equals 1, again this is at the same order, alpha squared, as the kinetic energy term as compared to the h0. And finally, we will check the Darwin delta H3 divided by H0 is, if I take the Darwin term, it is pi H bar squared E squared divided by 2M C squared divided by the EN0, because in that particular base I'm comparing them, times delta cube R. What is this? Ah, be the 12, 2 M, it. Now, what is this? How do I <coughs> estimate this one? We have to remember the scaling property of the delta function. Let me remind you that and we'll use it there. And this scaling property can be immediately checked against the very definition of the Dirac delta because there is a defining relationship and in that you can really check it. It is the following delta. Delta AX is 1 over A delta X. How do you do that? You just integrate this. The integral should be 1 and then you immediately get that this is the scaling property. 
And what about the scaling property of this delta cube r? If you write this as radial distance times the unit vector, which is a dimensionless quantity, then obviously this becomes 1 over r cube delta cube r. So if you take the expectation value of this quantity delta cube r, then it is 1 over the length cube, which we have taken to be typical of size of the atom as a0, the Bohr radius, times this thing is a dimensionless number. Say, take it to be at the order of 1, as it is dimensionless. So then the delta H3 divided by the En0 is going to be, because now I put the approximation, because this order of magnitude estimations, everything is to be taken on that stage, pi h bar squared e squared divided by 2 m squared c squared times 1 over e n 0 times 1 over a 0 cube. Right? It is coming from that direct delta. It looked very much like the previous example because of the appearance of a zero cube. Again, let me substitute the, its value as one over h power over mc alpha cube, or much much a better shortcut is uh, let's take it e squared over h bar c a better shortcut. So I will do that. e squared over, where was it, m e squared. h bar squared over m e squared. Let's see. Pi h bar squared e squared divided by 2 m squared c squared m cube e to the sixth h bar to the sixth power came up n times 1 over e n 0 which is alpha squared over 2 n squared times m c squared. Let's not get mixed up. So this is the expression. Let us try to collect everything and write it in a, in a single expression. So we still have E8, that's nice. E8 is given alpha to the 4, as you know. So delta H3 expectation value divided by H0 is now e to the 8, first of all, there is a pi over 2, there is an e to the 8, to keep track of everything, times there is an h bar 6 down here, there is a, f these two cancel, let's get rid of that, that two's cancel, e to the 8, h to the s 4, because that cancels and gives me h to the 4, just the desired form, c to the square c to the 4. And there is an m in here, m squared in here, m cube in here, they nicely cancel. And I have taken care of c's and e's, there is only one thing left, n divided by 1 over alpha squared times n. This is what? This is alpha to the 4, that's alpha squared, so pi alpha squared, pi and alpha squared. Beautiful, isn't it? This is the key word, is the alpha squared. All these things, thus, the lesson, delta hi divided by h0, all are order alpha squared. That's the point of this exercise. 
So we are in good shape. We can really use the algorithm of perturbation theory because there is the known term. Now I can call it large because the new terms are an alpha square order smaller than the original. So H0 is large. Delta HIs are small. As I said, please don't get confused. H0 is only the alpha squared order because that's a typical atomic energy level. But these are further alpha squared surplus, so they are alpha to the four order. Indeed, perturbation theory can be applied. Perturbation algorithm. Let's use that. I have to treat them in a lump because they are of all the same order. We have the H zeros and we have these three terms which are all the same order. But this is a degenerate perturbation theory. So we have to be careful in choosing a basis which diagonalizes, which diagonalizes the new terms. If it doesn't, we are in trouble. Because if we are going to carry out the computation for arbitrary n, for arbitrary n, the degeneracy is 2n squared. So we have to diagonalize 2n squared times 2n squared matrices. Forget it. You can only do it numerically with supercomputers. There is no way of doing that symbolically, except if we are lucky and we can find a basis which automatically diagonalizes them. So we look at the diagonal terms, we said these are the corrections to the energy levels. So what do we do? Let's start with the simplest term. As it doesn't involve uh, spin or anything like that explicitly, obviously it is quite easy to handle. Delta H1. I have already, when I was estimating the order of magnitude of that term, I have already rewritten it in a very nice form. What is it? Minus the kinetic energy squared divided by 2mc squared. That's good. Why it's good? Because the H0, the unperturbed part of the Hamiltonian, is that. The first term is the kinetic energy. Can I write the kinetic energy? as a zero plus e squared over r. That's beautifully nice, isn't it? So I have been able to express my new perturbation in terms of the unperturbed Hamiltonian itself. Thus, this becomes, delta H1 becomes minus 1 over 2 mc squared times H0 plus e squared over r squared. What is the ideal base? Ideal base even forgets about the spin for the computation of this. Why? Because if I have to include the spin, what is conserved is the total angular momentum, which is the sum of the orbital plus the spin. But here, this term, this particular term is insensitive to the spin, so I don't have to go to the spin case. And what is the then the diagonal basis, which the basis which diagonalizes this? It is the energy eigen. It's the energy eigenvectors basis is the one which diagonalizes. <clears throat> well, you may say, wait a minute. It's safe for H0, but it is the safe for the 1 over R's which would be coming in. And there's only one way to find out. We'll check indeed that it is diagonal. The first thing then we have to do is write an arbitrary matrix element and check it is diagonal, diagonal already and we finish the computation. So, why? Remember, we need the matrix representation of this. In where? In the degeneracy subspace. And look for the eigenvalues. Remember, that was the first statement which have we extracted from the non-perturbation theory, non-degenerate degenerate perturbation theory. So I need to compute this matrix element in the degeneracy subspace. Good. Then it becomes 1 over minus 1 over mc squared, the matrix element of 
darkness. What was the basis? N prime, L prime, M prime. N, sorry, the general subspace, N is the same. Only the LM indices change, right? N, L, M. I use shorthand, saying that in the left-hand side you have, for the given N, L prime, M prime. In the right-hand side you have LM. And you expand this and compute this matrix element. First, observe that it's diagonal. Then, just compute the diagonal elements. OK. Before that, let me expand this expre the, the square. Ex let me compute the square. Well, just taking into account that there are operators, therefore we have to pay attention to the ordering. Plus e to the 4 divided by r squared. That's the expression in there. If I take now the matrix element, L prime, M, M prime in here, and LM in here, let me use shorthand instead of repeating myself many times. So I have h bar squared plus e squared h0 1 over r plus 1 over r h0 plus e to the 4 1 over r squared. Symbolically, I just use a quick notation. Now I can explain myself. H0, acting on any one of those states, they have both n, L prime, M prime, and Lm. They, have, they are the same n because we are in the same degenerate subspace. H0 acting on that state gives you what? En0, right? Therefore, this thing becomes twice En0, 1 over r nicely. Again, L prime, M prime in the one side, LM in the other side. Similarly in here. And what about this one? This is EN0 squared already. So you see it was a nice indeed and useful trick because that helped me in reducing the problem rather fast and even sort of hinting that it's diagonal. Why do I say sort of? Well, of course there's no question that it's going to be Diagonal, but I'm going to demonstrate in a moment why these spherically symmetric, centrally symmetric quantities, you can replace it with any, any f of r. I'll demonstrate that they are diagonal. But let me write an intermediate expression before moving ahead. En0 squared twice e0, 2 e squared en0 times 1 over r plus e to the 4, 1 over r squared. That's the expression of the expectation value. And I have these two expectation values need to be computed. I'm going to give you a generic proof now. The generic proof is f of, f of r. So that it's going to va be valid for both this one and that one. Even higher, 1 over r cube, r to the 4, whichever you want. In the NLM basis. So I'm going to compute the expectation value of this. What is it? d cube x, or the, the volume if you want, you can write it as the dr r squared, d omega. As we are in the spherical polar coordinates, let's use this particular measure. So what? Psi nl prime m prime zero r theta phi times f of r sign NLM r theta phi. It looks horrendous and you may say are you going to get a useful result from such a closed form? Yes, we are going to indeed find a rather beautifully simple result from that closed form. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is the following. What is this? This is r, let's, just, let's put the star, that's complex conjugation because for the excited levels, we are going to have the complex conjugation. N L prime, that's real, because that's a function of R only, times Y L prime M prime star theta phi, 
use the symbolic notation of omega times f of r times r n l r times y l m omega. You see how beautifully factorized they are. I will write it now in the following form. dr r squared. You remember the limits of the r is 0 to infinity half line times r n l prime r r n l r times f of r. The beauty of the game is that whichever, uh, whatever uh, is inside for f r, it is in the factorized form. That sol solves the problem for you. What is the remaining? Remaining is the omega y l prime m prime star capital omega y l m omega. Look at these expressions. The first one, you say, what is the first one? I say, I don't care. What is the second one? It is the orthonormalization of the spherical harmonics as the common eigenfunctions of L squared L z. They are orthonormal. Therefore, this expression is equal to what? That's equal to delta L L prime delta M M prime. Is this the result I was looking for? Proving that they are diagonal? Indeed so. So the first one is going to give some lump. Doesn't matter. So this is diagonal, diagonalization. Diagonal in the, what space diagonal? Degeneracy subspace, the same n. And it's not an extra label. L, L prime, M, M prime. Very nice. So what I have to do then is, as this is diagonal, I just focus on the diagonal elements. So I can write the result down immediately. So delta H1. And LM. Now I put the expectation value instead of matrix representation, L prime, M prime in one side is LM is equal to minus 1 over 2 M squared C squared. And all everything else is EN0 squared plus twice E squared EN0. 1 over r and 11 plus e to the 4 1 over r squared and 11. So let's use the known results of these. In 507, when I used to teach some years ago, for example, these kind of sum rules I used to assign as homeworks to prove, to construct the general form of the 1 over r, 1 over r squared, 1 over r cube. But instead of actual physical, you find good, nice sum rules that which relates them together and you can solve them in closed form. So I don't know whether you have gone through that or not, I don't mind, but I will write down the results so that at least we can finish the computation. This is in the NLM basis is given 1 over A0 N squared. And the 1 over R squared in the NLM basis is given as 1 over A0. You, you see dimensional consistency is made manifest. 1 over the distance, 1 over the distance, 1 over the distance squared, 1 over the distance squared. So if you copy them wrongly, and you have to catch yourself that somehow this is not logical. n cube L plus a half. You see, they're not that simple, obviously. So what we have to do now is to substitute these expressions up and finish the computation of the delta H1. So let me try to do that as fast as possible. Perhaps some of the intermediate algebraic steps, which requires no more than primary school algebra, you can do it on your own. Okay, uh, let me 
Let me write them down now. Delta H1 and 11. is minus m squared c squared e n zero squared times twice e squared e n zero times that one over r expression that is a zero n squared next plus e to the 4, e to the 4, divided by a 0 squared n cube L plus a half. Well, that's in principle the result. You know what e n 0, etc. are. However, you may say, well, it looks a bit complicated. Is there a way of simplifying it? Of course, there's a way of simplifying it, provided that we e, e, do some nice, ingenious algebraic methods. First of all, I have to uh, warn you that we are going to give the results in terms of the en0 time alpha squared. Therefore, let's use that shortcut. Of course, I can just substitute everything and try to entangle afterwards or from the beginning I can try to uh, I can try to factor out e n zero times alpha squared perhaps and see what do I get. Why do I say so? Because when I compare the corrections with respect to the e n zero I had recovered an alpha squared. So I'm trying that's that's leading the way for me. The new terms contribution will be e n zero times alpha squared order because the first simple estimations also indicated that. Okay, that's that's what I'm trying to do now. Şimdi bu işten öbür ucu nasıl göreceğim ben göremeyeceğim tabii ki. O zaman ne yapacağız? Burada da ara stepler yok. Biraz. Hmm, şöyle yapayım. Delta H1. <coughs> the first term has E n zero squared. So let me take E n zero as one of the factors out. And then what is remaining inside, I will have an minus E n zero divided by two m squared c squared. And I will recover one more alpha squared later, but let me uh, do this as it is. So minus e squared, minus e squared, minus e squared divided by m squared c squared is obviously the second term I recovered there. Two is cancelled because a n zero is factored divided by a zero and n squared. There is an n squared in here, there is an e zero. e squared divided, h bar squared divided by m e squared. So that is also taken care of because I have already moved one e n zero out. The last term is not that simple. So therefore I will do last term separately in the following manner. Minus one over 2m squared c squared, that, that term is already there in the first place, e to the fourth, e to the fourth, a zero squared is h bar squared divided by m e squared squared. You see? And n cube and l plus a half, I cannot do much about them, so let me leave them there. n cube and l plus a half. That's the last term. As I said, the first, uh, the each term I have to treat separately. Let me look at, let me number them first. Let me call it the first term 
and the second term, and the third term. What is the f that first term? Minus plus alpha squared over 2n squared mc squared divided by twice m squared c squared. OK. So this one is alpha squared over alpha squared over 4n squared times m. Let's see whether we have made any mistake somewhere. There is a... No, I guess we have not. I guess we have not. EN0 is moved out. There is another EN0 inside. <coughs> OK. So alpha squared divided by 4n squared, c's go away, and there is an m in there. OK. Now what about the second term? Second term, again, I have to handle the second group there. It is, there is a minus sign in the front. And there was a minus sign here, but that was converted by the n0, but this is indeed a minus sign. So, one of them goes away, and I have then e to the 4 divided by h bar squared c squared. That's nice. And 1 over n squared. Yes. And n. That is an alpha squared. So this one is minus alpha squared divided by n squared times 1 over m. That's the second term. Yanlış taşıdık. M, M, M. 2M C square değil, 2M tabii. 2M, çok güzel. 2M olduğu için deminden beri diyordum ya, burada bir M sakatlığı var diye bunu yanlış kopyaladık buraya. Yanlış kopyaladık, tamam güzel. İyi şimdi çözdüm. Ben diyorum ya da şu andan beri bir M derdimiz var diye harika. M, M. Evet, aslında harika ötesi, harikadan da iyi. Güzel. That's what I was looking for indeed. So finally, the third term. The third term is, again, that's indeed a minus 2mc squared. So, m squared comes up, e4, e8, h4 to the 4, 1 over n cube, l plus a half. How nice. Now, I will uh, do the following trick. One of the m's cancel. This m cancels against that m. And I need an additional c, c squared in here because that's a c squared. I need I need to complete it to alpha to the four. I, I put a c squared in here, a c squared in there, and we are in game now. What do I mean is the following? I have minus a half there, and there is an m c squared. That's nice. There is e to the 8 divided by h bar to the 4, c to the 4, that's furthermore very nice, and times 1 over n cube, l plus a half. I'm doing this in detail so that you follow the algorithm, because when you see such complicated things, I know that the first reaction is, who cares? 
instead try to write the result down and use it in the exam out of the memory. That's, uh, that's unfair to your brains. Huh? Don't, don't fill in that garbage into the brain. Try to reconstruct it all the time. So that's alpha to the four, nice. If it's alpha to the four, and now what I have to do is I have to create an en zero from one of those and then write the remaining as factor. So notice that. I can use this minus, nice. I can use alpha square part of the alpha to the four. And there is two and n squared. That's great. Times an mc squared, that's also nice. So what is left over? What is left over is an alpha squared, because this was alpha to the four, half of it I have used in here, half of it is, remains, and that's it essentially. Alpha squared divided by n times l plus a half. And what is this entire thing? This entire thing can be written easily because this first factor is nothing but en zero. You see how simple it became again. So we can see, put the results down. Perhaps in the other parts, I, I'm not going to be that detailed. But this first portion, I want to be a, an educative, educative example. So altogether what? Altogether, we have the following. Delta H1 expectation value is in the front. There is an EN0 factor, which I have already factored out. And so the, f the sum of the, f the first and the second is alpha squared, 4N squared, alpha squared, N squared, 1 over 4 minus 1 is minus 3 quarters, right? So it is minus 3 quarters times N squared in here, times alpha squared. That is the sum of 1 and 2. And what about the last one? Last one is en0 times alpha squared divided by n l plus a half. So I can really combine everything. How do I do that? en0 alpha squared divided by n is the first prefactor I write. And remaining is minus three-quarter n alpha squared. No, alpha squared is already taken out. Plus uh, one over l plus a half. Isn't that amazing? Out of all these cumbersome, complicated expressions, we have come out with such a beautiful result. It's indeed very aesthetical. Yes. Even the signs, miraculously, that, that we can do it on the board without a sign mistake is amazing because usually you are bound to make a mistake, right, in such complicated things. Okay, that's the first term. So I have two more terms yet to go, and, but the second and third terms are rather complicated. Let me start patiently with this handling bit of the spin orbit. Uh, it's, it's, well, let's go rather slowly because that's a very complicated thing. We set this aside and we will wait till the end of the day till I finish the computation of the second and the third. Delta H2 was what? E squared over 2 MC squared M squared. M squared. This time I have to do it correctly. S dot L RQ. That was the delta H2. Now life is tough. Particularly the warning I have repeated myself several times about is in front of us. What is it? This thing. Obviously the presence of that is telling us that you have to, uh, we have to uh, include spin. Once the spin is included, the, the conserved total angular momentum is L plus S. And of course, it satisfies the usual 
angular momentum algebra as individual L and S are satisfying that algebra, this J is also satisfying that algebra. J I, J J, I H bar epsilon I J K, J K. That's the algebra. And all the other features that you are familiar with is also valid. That is J squared commutes with any component of this. But what is the point is that, well, being Hermitian operators, etc. now I can together with the spin, in the presence of spin, the complete set of operators might be these well, actually, a little more than that. Now, there is an important challenge in here for those of you who don't remember those subjects well enough from your previous courses. Check that in these, these, are, these form, they commute, indeed, each of them. But I cannot add in here LZ or SZ. That's, then therefore their common eigen vectors, well, we are in this degeneracy subspace. N is given, that space is fixed. So let me not complicate the life. Well, their eigen value set are at J, M, J, but also L and S is there because they commute. Well, this is one eigenvector set. There is also another complete orthonormal eigenvector set. This is called, the, in the terminology of certain books, this one is called the coupled basis, as you remember from your previous courses. And there is also another eigenvector basis, which is obtained by taking the direct product of the two different bases, namely, this also constitutes a complete set because they commute among themselves. Again, I invite you please to check these. Well, obviously, the bases associated with this part is this, the basis associated with that part is SMS, and I claim that uh, the, another likely candidate to be selected as a proper basis is this uncoupled basis, which is obtained by taking the direct product of the two different bases. For the first part, the kinetic part, we didn't have such a, such a complication, but for this problem, obviously, the, this discussion is very relevant. Well, besides, these are the only two bases in hand. I don't have anything more. If you are lucky, one of them should diagonalize this uh, strange-looking Hamiltonian, if you're lucky. If it doesn't, of course, then we are in trouble. But fortunately, it does. For the following reason, S dot L is obviously is contained in the square of that J operator. Let's demonstrate it. If I take the J squared, the total angular momentum squared, it is L squared plus S squared plus twice L dot S. Okay. So if I solve S dot L, L dot S, whichever, because they live in two different spaces, right? Orbital and spin space are, uh, do not have any overlap. Therefore, you are free to use any order you like. This, besides, let me use it with two. two. J squared minus L squared minus S squared. Then you say, this is really luck. Because if that expression is like so, you see that everything in there is contained in that compatible set of commuting operators. So if I use that basis, 
they are going to be diagonal. Because j, act, j square acting on that gives you what? It gives you j times j plus 1 times h bar squared. And this is acting on that basis gives you L times L plus 1 h bar squared. And this one gives you S times S plus 1 h bar squared. So you can really turn your attention directly to the computation of eigenvalues, which are nothing but the diagonal elements, and the matrix is diagonal. So let me start computing the expectation values of the delta H2 in that particular basis, coupled basis. <coughs> delta H2, J M J I call it, N J M J. Right, this is the basis now I'm using because it turned out that things are diagonal in there. So what is it? It is the following, E squared over 2M squared C squared. Two M squared four Okay. So these acting to the left then gives you the associated expression e squared h bar squared times j, j plus 1 minus l, l plus 1 minus s, s plus 1 divided by 4 m squared c squared times Of course, till now everything was, well, by the way, S is a one half, so this is one half times three halves, so this is three quarters. That portion is easy. What we have to do next is, perhaps I have to write the result of that down too, so that we can proceed. Here there is, a, a, in the past I have spent some time, a few minutes, 10, 15 minutes to demonstrate that this could immediately be reduced to the LML basis computation using the Klebsch gordon coefficients and their uh, unitarity property. I'm going to skip that and I assign you to carry out that computation on your own to come up with the following result. Notice that this is JMJ basis and we have started with that. And how is it, being spherically symmetric, how do I convert this to, into the computation of LML? If I expand the JMJ basis in terms of the direct product basis using Klebsch-Gordon coefficients and their unitarity properties, you can immediately reduce it. Well, a bit of uh, computation needed, obviously. It's not a three minutes uh, computation, but I will do, assign it as a homework, private homework for you. Do it on your own. Not for me, but on your own. And then this reduces to this LML basis computation expectation. But we are not finished yet. I have to warn you, I have to add one sentence and we'll stop for today. 
Notice that the addition of angular momenta problem is a rather advanced, involved problem. Because what you have again is j equals L plus L S, and there are the eigen eigenvalues associated with these, as I have indicated before. And there are relationship between the J and the others, which is entering into the combination. And J runs from L minus S to L plus S. And for our problem, it's L minus a half and L plus a half, because S is one half. So therefore, there are a, a set of relations between the LS and J. In one case, J is equal to L plus a half. In other case, J L minus a half. So we have to discuss this prefactor accordingly. So you have one possible problem is L minus a half. The other is L plus a half. We have to reduce the prefactor for this case and for that case separately and write the results accordingly. And that is going to be the starting point of our lecture next week. So I stop in here.